make mistakes, as my parents tell me every single day, but nine times out of ten, you can kind of just move on with this and get on with your life. But on occasion, it may actually affect your career. Which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Hello, my name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you for joining me. And this is 10 Exact Moments WWE killed careers. Number 10, Dr. Death gets knocked out. Now, if you don't know, the Brawl for All tournament that happened in the late 90s was basically designed to get Dr. Death over. He'd been brought in for Japan and Jim Ross especially thought, well, if we can make him appeal to the WWE universe, he could be a good opponent for Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, if you know about the Brawl for All and the fact that it was a proper shoot fight, you will ask yourself, well, it's wrestling. Why the hell didn't they just work this? You tell me. Because the problem was when Dr. Death came up against Bart Gunn, Bart was like, well, I want to win the Brawl for All. That may be great for my career. <laughs> it wasn't. It was basically the end of him too. He punched the Doc right in the face. He was knocked out and this whole thing was done. And you also had the fallout from this because Bart Gunn had always been presented as a tag team wrestler. So when it was him that sparked out our great new hope, Every single audience member went, well, now I don't believe in that guy because of everything that's come before this. Death then vanished from TV for ages, although he did come back in early 1999. But soon after that, he was gone from the company. So this didn't help his WWE stint at all. Number nine, the Spirit Squad gets sent packing. I will never understand this one because while the Spirit Squad were a interesting gimmick, at least they did their job. They went out to the ring, they danced around going, Woo-hoo-wee! and everybody wanted to boo them. They also got into a few with D-Generation X, which was fine for what it was. But at some stage, the powers that be decided, oh no, we, we've done too much with the Spirit Squad. So they quite literally sent them packing back to developmental. So on the 27th of November 2006 Raw, Triple H and Shawn Michaels quite literally put them in a box, I'm not kidding, stuck an address on it that was like, send to OVW. And then they walked off just chuckling away. And do you know what happened to the Spirit Squad after this? They all fell by the wayside, apart from Dolph Ziggler, who was Nicky, I believe, he was able to swim his way back in. So yeah, tying into this list, it was basically the end of their time in WWE, and I don't get why they did this, the spirit squad was fine. Number eight, Gene Snitsky likes feet. I mean, what do you want me to tell you? In 2005, all of a sudden, Snitsky told us he was into feet. And there was a bunch of backstage segments where he was rubbing people's feet. There were some other backstage segments where he wanted to rub somebody's foot and that person said no, and he was disappointed. I mean, was this going to main event WrestleMania? No. It gets even worse because there is an interview out there with Nick Dinsmore, who played Eugene, where he was asked about this, and he said the idea was born out of the fact that the real Gene Snitsky was massively in to Tootsie Toes. I don't want to talk about this anymore, so we going on to the next one. Number seven, Hornswoggle is the anonymous GM. On the 9th of July, 2012 episode of Raw, we were finally told that the anonymous GM of Raw was Hornswoggle. Now, if you were not around for this period, the damn anonymous GM storyline had been going on for so long that it would have to have been, I don't know, The Rock or Stone Cold Steve Austin or someone of that magnitude for it to be justified. And when it was Hornswoggle and it was played off like a joke, well, that was the end. And the only reason we did do this is because we didn't actually have a payoff for the angle and fans were so mad they needed somebody to vent at and poor Swags was a target for obvious reasons. What really sucked about this is that by and large, most people actually quite enjoyed Fit Finley's son. He was a bit ha ha funny funny, but after this, there was no going back. So as ever, if you are going to write a story, make sure you know what the ending is. Don't just make it up as you go along, otherwise you get this. Number six, the fake Razor Ramon debuts. I mean, what was Rick Bogner going to do? I bet he had trained for hours and I bet he was over the moon to get a WWF contract. And then Vince McMahon told him, you know that guy we just got rid of. Well, we own his character and we own his gimmick. So we just gonna give it to you. It meant when he did debut after Jim Ross introduced him, he had to be all like, yo man, I'm Razor Ramon. Even though every single person in the audience and the entire world knew he wasn't Razor Ramon. Glenn Jacobs also gets thrown into this mix because he was introduced as fake Diesel. But have you seen Glenn Jacobs? He is massive. He is like a legit 6'8", 6'9", 6'10". So he was always gonna find some place in professional wrestling. But Rick needed something else and instead he got this. Do not forget too, when Kane finally did arrive, he was wearing a mask, so nobody made this association. 
Honestly, it's one of the worst ideas ever. Like, imagine someone just replaced me now and, oh, I'm Simon Miller. You'd be like, no, you're not. And the same guy would be like, well, no, I actually am. Unless it's like a perfect clone, it is doomed to fail. Number five, Rocco Rex Hawk. Even Bret Hart on Kayfabe Commentaries has talked about this. But for some reason in 1992, WWF's big plan for the Legion of Doom was for their manager, Paul Ellering, to have a hand puppet named Rocco. And when Hawk found out about this, quite understandably, he completely melted down. The best part about all of this is that if you go do watch an interview from the man around this era, anytime that puppet pops up, you can see it in his face. I actually think he wants to hit him. So it was like this, and that's right, I got a puppet of my own, but Hawk would stand there and just do this. There's also stories out there that after SummerSlam 1992, Hawk was so annoyed by all of this, he went on a massive bender, and I don't know about that, but imagine you had to play a big tough guy, and then you got to talk to a puppet. Number four, the gobbledygooker. I mean, what else are we meant to do? Survivor Series 1990, after weeks of build, the WWF promised us something massive, something huge, a massive surprise was gonna come out of this giant egg and it was just somebody dressed as a turkey. Now the incredible bit is that Vince McMahon actually thought that this would be the new mascot of the World Wrestling Federation because Nintendo had Mario and Sonic had Sega. Why couldn't we have one? And what he came up with was that. There'll be a picture right there. I mean, that will give you nightmares. It was awful for Hector Guerrero as well, who was the person underneath this suit. And he was a really good wrestler. And oh, to be a fly on the wall when they came up with this. Surely at least one person said, uh, excuse me, I don't think that we should be doing it. And surprise, surprise, when we realized how bad it was, Hector couldn't land another job in WWE obvious reasons. Number three, Lance Storm is boring. I hated this one, I hated it then, and I hated it now. If you have listened to Lance Storm talk about professional wrestling in 2022, he has such an incredible mind for the business that everybody should have been walking up to him in the 90s and 2000s going, please, Mr. Storm, can you help me be better? But for some reason, Vince McMahon didn't see it this way, and he decided that Lance Storm was boring, to the point that during one of his matches, out came Stone Cold Steve Austin with a microphone and said, you know, we should probably end this Lance because you are sending me to sleep. So who the hell was gonna care about Lance Storm after this when the company was saying, yeah, we don't really think that you should care about this guy. And they tried to turn it around by teaming him with Goldust and have him dance around a little bit. But Lance Storm doesn't need to dance. He just needs to wrestle because again, he was so damn good. So if Lance Storm ever sees this, you get a salute from me, you're a hero. Number two, Rikishi did it for Duroc. Do you remember how over Rikishi was? If you don't, go back to 1999 or 2000. Wait until you hear the two cool music. Meow, 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 that weird little noise. And then wait for the crowd pop. People love this guy. So it made all the sense in the world that eventually we're gonna try and push him to the main event level. But who in their right mind went, right, listen, just one second. You know how popular the quiche is with his massive ass. Why don't we turn him into a bad guy? And why don't we have him responsible for running over Stone Cold Steve Austin? This was all revealed on the 9th of October 2000 Raw when then GM Mick Foley said it was you, Rikishi. And honestly, the nonsense that came out of his mouth with the final thing being, I did it for the rock. And do we know even in 2022 why he did it for the rock? We have no flubbing idea. It was fumbled so badly that Keish was moved out of the way so Triple H could take this spot. And it was just a downward spiral after this, and soon he was released as well. I mean, Rikishi should have been there for years, but no, we had to come up with this. Number one, DDP is the stalker. Even Diamond Dallas Page has talked about this one and how stupid it was, because seriously, if you would watch DDP in WCW at all, why would he go to the WWF and stalk The Undertaker and his wife? Let's think about it for a few seconds. Nope, there is no answer. I mean, nothing about this repackage made any sense. It was like Vince McMahon just had this gimmick on a window shelf and was waiting to give it to someone and then DDP happened to turn up, so he pushed two things together, even though that should never have happened to begin with. And seriously too, Paige's career in the WWF never really recovered after this. Like he did do all those fun skits with Christian, but this was Diamond Dallas Page, and if you had treated him right, 
he could have had a world title run and I don't think anybody would have been complaining. It doesn't matter because today DDP is a damn legend and goes around saving people's lives and he has DDPY, which is really good. I do it a couple of times a week. But yeah, this was such a bad move and took DDP in the World Wrestling Federation and sent him on a course to nothing. Nor any other exact moments that WWE killed careers, let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like the video, share the video and subscribe. Then look, you can go to whatculture.com. We have articles on all kinds of stuff. Give it a read. We have a YouTube channel. See if there's other videos you do like and give it a click. And also social media. That's a thing. Come say hey. My name is Simon What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. You take care of yourself. You have a lovely day. You have a great month. You have a wonderful year. And hopefully somewhere in that time period, I will see you soon.